Good morning and welcome to today's webcast, R&D Tax Opportunities for Wineries, Breweries, and Distilleries. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of the polling questions, which we'll ask throughout today's presentation. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE progress widget to open a PDF file that you can save to your computer. Don't worry if you can't download your PDF certificate today, we'll email a copy to you in two weeks. If you're attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our attendance sheet to receive CPE credit. The attendance sheet is available in the slide deck and handouts widget. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. Also note that CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and isn't available to participants who view the on-demand version. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see isn't legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. And I'm pleased to introduce today's presenters from Moss Adams R&D Tax Services Group. Travis Riley, Senior Manager, and Andrew Stoll, Senior. Travis, I will now turn the line over to you to get us started. All right. So my name is Travis Riley. I'm a Senior Manager here at Moss Adams, talking to you today from Northern California. Over the past 12 or so years, I have helped hundreds of clients across many different industries save money on taxes through R&D tax credits. All right, and my name is Andrew Stoley, and I'm a senior here at Moss Adams, and I've uh, been working in accounting for about five years, and the last three of those years have been focusing exclusively on the R&D tax credit. I've uh, worked in a wide variety of industries. I specialize in agribusiness, wineries, uh, manufacturing, and software and technology. Great. So we wanted to start off just by showing you the agenda, show you what we're going to be talking about over the next hour or so, give you kind of a roadmap. We're going to start here by talking about the opportunity that's available at the federal level and at the state level, talk about the magnitude of credits that might apply to your company. Then we're going to dig into qualified activities. So if you're on the line and you're a company, you're asking yourself, do we qualify for R&D credits? Or if you're an accountant and you're wondering, do my clients qualify for R&D credits? And after we go through this section, we're hoping that you'll be able to answer those questions. Then after that, we're going to dive into how the credit is actually calculated. We're going to talk about the types of expenses that you can include and how that actually translates into a dollar for dollar credit. And so we'll get into some of the mechanics of how that works. After that, we're going to move on and talk about some audit trends that we're seeing. So if you ever find yourself being audited by the IRS or the FTB, we're going to talk about you know, what you can expect to see on some of those examinations and, and how to approach it. After that, we'll dig into documentation. Uh, it's a big topic everyone wants to talk about. If you're claiming R&D credits, they should be documented properly. We're going to talk about what proper documentation means. After that, we'll move on and talk about some new legislation. We'll touch a little bit on tax reform. I know tax reform is a hot topic right now, so we'll cover some of the changes with respect to the R&D credits. 
Then we'll move on from there and answer any questions if we have time left over. So before we dig into the opportunity, I thought it might be helpful to give you a little more background about the credit and talk about how it's evolved over the years. And the reason that I wanted to do this is because I talk to clients all the time who tell me, you know, they looked at R&D credits 10 or 15 years ago and they didn't really think it applied to their company and so they want to know what's changed. So I want to talk a little bit about some of those changes and specifically this second bullet point, the 2004 final regulations, where there was the elimination of this discovery test. What that discovery test said is that you had to be, basically be developing something new to the world, something that has never been done before in order to qualify for the R&D credits. In 2004, that discovery test was eliminated. And so in order to qualify now, you don't have to be developing something that's new to the universe. It just has to be new to your company. I think it's important to point that out. I know oftentimes when I'm talking to people and they hear the word R&D, automatically they're thinking of you know, scientists in lab coats in a, in a laboratory messing around with test tubes. Or maybe they're thinking of you know, SpaceX, Google, Apple, self-driving cars. That's not necessarily the case. We're going to go over what the requirements are, but the R&D credit really applies to a lot more companies. And I think it's very evident if you just go to the IRS's website and you look at some of their data, some of the most recent data, you'll see that only 26% of credits claimed by corporations are, in the, are from companies in the information, scientific, and technical sectors. So that leaves a lot of credits being claimed by different industries. So let's first talk about the federal credit. This is a pretty lucrative credit. The way it works is you take all of your qualified expenses and the credit ends up being about 6.5% of those costs. It could, be, it could be a little less than that. It could be a little more depending on each company's specific facts and circumstances. But when I'm talking to people, I think 6.5% is a really good rule of thumb to, to apply. So another way to look at that is if you have $1 million in qualified R&D expenses, then that would translate into roughly a $65,000 tax credit. And when we're looking at tax credits, you're probably looking at the current year. And right now, I think a lot of people are filing their 2017 tax returns. So not only could you look at a credit in 2017, but you could also go back and amend all open tax returns. And for federal purposes, all open tax returns include three years. So you could potentially go all the way back to 2014 and claim a credit also in 15, 16, and 17. So you're looking at four years of potential credits, and this can really add up. Now, if you calculate credits and you're in a position where you have more credits than you have taxes due, then the credits carry back one year or they carry forward for up to 20 years until they expire. Also at the federal level is the new $250,000 or up to $250,000 tax credit against payroll. And this is really important for companies that don't have enough federal tax liability to use up all their credits. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. So also, because we're here on the West Coast, I'm talking to you from California today, wanted to talk a little bit about the California credit. The California credit, for the most part, follows the federal rules with um, a few exceptions. And one of those exceptions is that you must actually be performing the research within the state of California to qualify. Also, the California credit is pretty lucrative. What I like to tell people is that the California credit can be just as much as the federal credit, maybe even a little bit more. So that same 6.5% rule of thumb can apply here. And so if you have a million dollars in R&D spending and you're performing all of your research in California, that's another 65 grand. So between the federal and the state credits, it's $130,000 or 13% of your R&D spending if you had a million dollars in qualified costs. Like the federal credit, the California credit can be applied to all open tax years. In California, you have 
up to four years of open returns that you can go back and amend. Also, if you have more credits than tax liability and you can't use them all, then the credits will carry forward and the California credits carry forward forever. <clears throat> all right, so another state credit that we wanted to highlight is the Oregon credit. We're seeing a, a ton of brewers pop up in Oregon, so we thought it's worth mentioning. For the most part, the Oregon credit also follows the federal definition of qualified research with some exceptions. And in order to qualify for this one, you have to be performing research within the state of Oregon. It is not quite as lucrative as the California credit. You're looking at 2.5% to 5% of your qualified expenses translating into a credit. And so on a million dollars in qualified costs, under that example I used previously, you would have a $25,000 to $50,000 credit. A couple of other things to mention for Oregon, they do have a five-year carry forward, and also the Oregon credit cannot exceed $1 million in one year. All right, so I wanted to put this slide up just to show you all of the different states that have R&D credits. And this kind of changes a little bit from year to year, but I thought it was important to point out if you're doing business in any of these states, they could also have credits. Many of the, the other state credits, they do mirror the federal credit. They are kind of modeled after that, but some of them are also a little bit different. Uh, some of these credits are actually refundable. Some of them you can actually sell them to other people if you can't use them. So it really just depends on the state. But if you're doing business in one of these, it's definitely worth taking a look at. So Andrew, you want to talk about some of the clients we've done work for? Yeah, definitely. So before we jump into the weeds um, in terms of the mechanics of the credit and, and whatnot, I thought it would be helpful to run through what the credit is going to look like for some of the companies that we've worked with. Um, so in recent years, we're just going to talk about three different, um, three different clients that we've worked with and, and the activities that they were doing and, and uh, what the credit was that they were able to calculate. So for this first case study, uh, it's a, a winery here in Northern California, a small to mid-sized winery, about $2.8 $2 million in annual revenue. Um, and in a one-year evaluation, we were able to find them about $60,000 in combined credits. And combined, I just mean um, between federal and California credits. So the activities uh, that, that drove that credit <clears throat> that they were looking at during this year. Uh, the first of those was evaluating the effects of staves as barrel inserts. So this company wanted to use some old barrels or metal tanks, but they still wanted the flavor of that oak barrel. So what they were doing was they were experimenting with the quantity of the staves that they were inserting into, into different barrels, um, the size of different staves, length of time that they were in the barrel in order to achieve that desired result. Um, another thing that they were looking at was experimenting with new blends. This might be familiar to a lot of you if you have um, a, kind of a wine that comes out. It doesn't stand real well on its own, um, but you think it may work well as a blend. Uh, it can be a lot of experimentation surrounding um, the, the different ratios and, and additives that are, that are going to get a blend to work out. And then the third thing that they were looking at during this particular year, uh, those of you familiar with, with Northern California you know that we have a, a fire season, and that fire season can really affect, um, affect the crop. So um, they, were, they were experimenting on, on removing smoke taint from grapes. So uh, the smoke flavor gets into grapes. Uh, it can affect different vines and different, uh, different vineyards, kind of depending on, on their proximity to the fire differently. So each of the vines' exposure can differ. And that means there's, there's a lot of difficulty developing a consistent treatment to remove that flavor. So there's extensive testing. Uh, all throughout the process from the grapes themselves, the juice, and all the way through the wine. Andrew, I think that 60000 was just one year alone, right? It was just one year, yep. Nice. All right, the second example that we're going to look at, uh, Good Size Oregon Brewery. Uh, so they have about $11 million in annual revenue, and again, combined in one year, uh, between Oregon and federal, we were able to dig up $185,000 in credit. Some of the activities that drove this credit, um, th this particular brewery, the demand was outpacing their ability to supply a product. So they were looking at a brew house expansion. So anything that's, that's new in terms of this large scale operational change is going to involve a lot of uncertainty. So they wanted to integrate new highly customized equipment into their operation, hop strainer, brew kettle, 
um, things like that. And then the other thing that they were looking at was the, uh, the wastewater treatment. So uh, wastewater needs to meet requirements before it's, before it's released and discharged, uh, just according to the Clean Water Act. So they were looking at uh, different ways to, to process the water in order to discharge it safely. Um, water can be also naturally acidic and corrosive. So, so part of this was examining how to, how to lower that acidity and that corrosiveness because the equipment that the water is running through is very expensive, so they're, they're protecting their assets. Company makes really good beer, too. All right, and then the third one that we're going to look at, we're back in Northern California uh, with a, another winery, $6 million in annual revenue. And this, you know, in a one year was a significant amount of credits. Uh, between California and federal credits, it was about $209,000. So the activities that we're looking at here, uh, flash detente processing. So in this particular case, some weather led to some under, in underripe grapes. Um, they had some mold problems, some, some color consistency problems. So this flash detente experimentation um, the goal of it was really to Im improve the consistency of a final product, even though the, the in inputs were, were pretty inconsistent. They were also looking at uh, some bacterial removal processes and, and also, interestingly, some barrel fermentation. So while pretty common with white wines, it's very expensive and in common, uh, or uncommon with, with red wines, but you get a great result with it. So the things that they were looking at were how to develop larger barrel openings so they could insert berries and clusters, and then how to empty and clean the barrels. It sounds simple, but those, the, the barrels are, are still expensive. They need to be reused, and there needs to be a, a good process in place in order to put those back into production. All right, next we're going to talk about uh, the, the qualified activities, how an activity is going to qualify for the credit. So activities must meet a four-part test in order to qualify. The credit is activity-driven. Um, and as Travis mentioned, there used to be a new to the world requirement, uh, but we really want to drive home the point that R&D does not require a lab coat, and all you need to do is demonstrate that the activities meet the four parts of this test here. The first test is the uncertainty test. So the activity needs to be undertaken um, to eliminate some sort of technical uncertainty regarding capability, methodology, or appropriateness of design. So at its most basic level, um, I, I guess the question at the, is, can we even do this? You have an idea uh, for a product or a process that you want to implement and just aren't sure if it's even possible. Um, more often what we see is that the client knows that it can be done, but they're just uncertain about what the best way or the most optimal design is to achieve that desired result. The second test here is the process of experimentation test. So uh, in order to solve for those uncertainties, a process needs to be de uh, designed to evaluate between one or more alternatives for achieving, achieving their desired result. So we can do uh, systematic trial and error, computer modeling, any sort of simulation. Uh, so what this might look like is if, if you're looking at putting some new equipment on a production floor, uh, you pick or evaluate a couple different components that are going to go into that equipment and then select the best one uh, that's going to work for your purposes or even where it's going to be placed. Or formulations, uh, if you're trying a couple different formulations, we talked about wine blends a little bit earlier, you're going to try multiple and test them and then select and move forward with the best result. The third test is the technological and nature test. Uh, so the process of experimentation must rely on the hard sciences here. So we're talking about engineering, physical sciences, biological, chemical sciences, and, and food science as well. Uh, and really what this is intended to carve out is any time that's going to be related to something like market research. Um, although there may be uncertainties there, it's, it's not technological in nature and therefore doesn't count. Um, also time, uh, like sales time or general administrative time. Um, so we're really just looking for, for something that's going to be technical and relying on the hard sciences. And finally, we have the qualified purpose test. Um, so the purpose of the research is to create a new or improve on an existing product, process, technique, formula, blend, um, and again, we want to drive home that we're not talking about new to the world here, new to you, new to the, new to the company, um, or, or even just measurable improvements in, in quality or performance over, over something that had existed in the past.
All right, time for our first polling question. How many tests must an activity pass in order to qualify for the R&D credit? And your options are one, two, four, or nine. And I'll give you a few moments to respond. To participate, please click the button next to the answer you choose and make sure you hit that submit button. And let's take a look at the results. All right, it looks like most of you are paying attention. So we have four, part, uh, four parts that we need to pass in order to qualify for the R&D credit. All right, so we talked a little bit about some of the activities that are going to qualify. We put together um, a kind of more extensive list, but it's by no means exhaustive. Uh, there's still a lot of activities that aren't listed here um, that are going to qualify. Uh, and in the interest of time, we're just going to go through a few of these, and the slides will be available after the webcast. Uh, what we're shooting for is if you, if you work for a company where some of these activities sound familiar or there's going to be something similar, um, it, there's a strong chance that you're going to qualify for the credit. Or if uh, you're a CPA and it, it sounds like your clients are, are dealing with some of these issues, then, then they may qualify as well. So first we're going to start talking about uh, with, with wineries and a little bit of grape growing. So uh, some of the activities that we're looking at is that maybe the development of new systems, structures, or techniques to improve the harvesting process. So if you're looking at uh, improved storage for longevity, harvesting a crop with less damage or more auto automation, or you're evaluating a, a, like a pilot characteristic in a new plot of land. So you want to expand uh, the operation, maybe a new vineyard, you know, perform some tests to make sure that that land's viable. Next we have crushing and pressing. So we talked about this a little bit earlier, but the development of, of new methods or systems to manage wastewater uh, that's generated from that crushing and destemming and processing um, or pressing process that's going to qualify with the Clean Water Act. And next we're at fermentation, and again, we, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but the development of new or improved fermentation methods, processes, or techniques, so, so the barrel fermentation. And then post-fermentation, um, we have things like development of new clarification method, methods and techniques, including improvements to the fining process and the filtration process. Um, or we have experimentation with various blends, where two standalone wines maybe don't work on their own. Uh, can we make a good blend out of that? And finally, for wineries, we have aging and bottling. Uh, an interesting one here is the design and development of subterranean wine cave improvements. So improvements to temperature control in order to increase consistency there or humidity control, um, wh whatever improvements that you're making that are going to improve or, or uh, going to increase the quality of the final product. Moving on to breweries. So uh, activities like development of new or improved bottle designs, cans or crowns, um, if, if any time you're changing the operation, there's going to be some uncertainty there. It's going to be technical, some engineering work, or improvements to the water recycling or waste management process. So very similar to how uh, wineries deal with this, um, brewers are dealing with it as well. All right, so beer styles and product development. So development of newer improved hopping techniques or newer improved fermentation processes or product formulations. Or are we making a new beer? Uh, activities surrounding creating that new beer. Um, there's going to be a lot of uncertainty, and that's most likely going to qualify. And finally, here we have distilleries. Uh, and, and again, I'm sure you're seeing a pattern here. We touched on a lot of these earlier, uh, but the development of new or improved product formulations or uh, new or improved quality, assist or quality assurance testing processes. So you need to ensure that that product uh, from bottle to bottle is going to be consistent across the board and you're developing a process uh, to ensure that, then that activity is most likely going to qualify. All right, our second polling question. Uh, true or false, market research costs are a qualified R&D expense. And your options are true or false. I'll give everyone a moment to make a decision. And as a reminder, if you would like to receive CPE credit for today's webcast, you will need to respond to at least three of the four polling questions. And this is our second one for today. And let's take a look at the results. 
All right, we're a little split here. Uh, the correct answer is this is false. So, so market research, the reason that it doesn't qualify is it doesn't meet that technological in nature test. So whereas we may have some uncertainty present, um, it's, it doesn't rely on the principles of, of the hard sciences, and therefore we cannot qualify market research. Also, if we ever wanted to get tax technical about this, you know, if you look at Code Section 174 and the regulations of Section 41, market research is actually a specifically excluded activity. So something to be aware of. All right, guys. Great. So Andrew went through a lot of content there, a lot of examples, and we could probably go through a whole bunch more. We went through it quickly, but I think the overall point is we're hoping that you see something on those slides or you heard something that kind of rings true with you. And you know, maybe you're doing something like that or you're, you're doing one of those activities and it's worth exploring a little bit more to see if we can get it to qualify. So once we've established that the activity qualifies and we're comfortable that you meet all those requirements and you're meeting the four-part test, the next question becomes, how do we calculate a credit? How does that translate into a dollar-for-dollar -dollar credit that's going to offset my taxes? So let's talk about that. There are really four categories of expenses related to those activities that we can include for the credit. I've got them all listed here. I'm not going to cover the third one down, computer leasing, just because that doesn't apply to most of the brewers and wineries that we've worked with. But we're going to cover wages, supplies, and contract research and talk about it in a little more detail. So we're going to start off with wages. And when we talk about wages, we are talking about the people who are doing the research. So maybe it's your winemaker or your head brewer. But we're also talking about people who are directly supervising and directly supporting the research. So for example, you know, sensory technicians, any kind of technician, if you have people out in the vineyard doing work, you know, maybe they're directly supporting some of the research activities. On the other side of that, if you're an owner of a company, you're a CEO, you know, if, it's, if you're sitting there coming up with new ideas, you are, you know, helping to set the technical direction and providing technical input on the way things are going, then it's possible that some of your time could also be included. And the other thing to point out here is when we talk about wages, we're talking about the amount that flows through on a box one W-2 wage. So that can include bonuses, it can include stock options, and this other, the second bullet here is really important. If you are a sole proprietorship or a partnership, which I know a lot of you are, the amount that you're receiving as pass-through income can be treated as a wage expense as long as it's subject to self-employment income. So for a lot of clients we work with, that number can be significant. Also, there's this 80% test. What that means is that if you spend at least 80% of the time doing qualified research, we can include 100% of your wages. Now, you don't have to be doing R&D 80% of the time to qualify. If you're involved in research 10% of the time, then we would take 10% of your wages, or whatever that percentage actually ends up being. I want to take you a little bit on a sidetrack here as we're talking about qualified wages and highlight a court case that's somewhat recent. This is from 2014. So in this case, a taxpayer claimed R&D credits the R&D credits were audited, the IRS denied all the credits, and then it went to tax court. And just to give you a little bit of background about this case, when the IRS did the audit, they came in, like I said, they denied the credits, and some of their arguments were that, A, the research was routine, the taxpayer was applying existing know-how and publicly available knowledge, and so they didn't qualify. And they even brought in their own expert from MIT to talk about how what they were doing wasn't very hard. Um, so that was one line of arguments that the IRS made. Second line of argument was that the QREs and estimates were not properly substantiated. They really don't, they didn't like the use of estimates. They said they weren't, they weren't legitimate. 
The uh, third line of attack is that the CEO doesn't qualify, the high wage executives, they don't qualify. And they also argue that the CEO's compensation was not reasonable. In this case, the CEO's compensation in one year alone was over $12 million. And I have to point out that they live in Texas. So I'm going to fast forward and talk about the overall results of this case and how it turned out. And the court actually found that even though the MIT expert and the IRS may have considered the research to be routine, it still met the four-part test. In fact, they looked at 12 projects and figured that 11 of them actually qualified. Secondly, they talked to the employees about how much time they spent on research. They actually put people up on the stand. And the court determined that their testimony was credible. The taxpayer also provided records to help back up their claims. And they provided things like project notes and testing data. The court also felt like that was reasonable. It felt like the estimates were reasonable. In fact, the CEO himself, Mr. Souter, was claimed at 75%. So 75% of his time and his wages were captured from the credit. The court thought that 75% estimate was reasonable. So a lot of positive takeaways here in this case. The only one that's not positive is this last one here. The courts did determine that the compensation, that $12.5 million a year, for a CEO in Texas was not reasonable when you measured that against other companies of a similar size. So if you're talking to Mr. Suter about this case, he probably doesn't like the outcome because he knocked his credit way down. But I think overall it was a positive case for the industry, for the R&D credit world, just because you know, it, it shows that CEOs, high wage executives can qualify. It, show, it helps to show that you don't have to be developing anything new to the world to qualify, and that estimates are reasonable as long as you can back them up and you can support it with credible people's testimony. So bringing you back now, now we're going to skip and talk about supplies. So if the research qualifies, we can include supplies that are used in that research. And generally, when we're talking about supplies, you know, we're talking about probably grapes, or if you're a brewer, ingredients. If you're tracking the wort separately, now those are the types of costs that we're generally able to pick up. Also, you know, it says that we cannot include depreciable property. However, if there is significant uncertainty, in, let, let's say you, you buy a highly customized and designed piece of equipment that's unique to you, and you're not actually sure if it's going to meet all of your requirements. Uh, let's say at the end of the day it ends up working, or you get it to work. Then we could potentially pick up those costs. And same thing with your inventory. If you have an experimental batch of wine, you're not really sure if it's going to meet all of your requirements for taste and feel, and you're not sure if customers are going to buy it. And if that uncertainty exists, and you end up selling it at the end of the day, maybe you sell it for a loss, maybe you barely break even, maybe even sell it for a profit. If it meets those requirements and that uncertainty element was present, you could still potentially pick those up as supply costs. So I thought it was really important to mention that, and I probably should have mentioned it when we talked about the evolution of the R&D credit, because this is a significant change back in 2014 where IRS allows prototypes, pilot models, product that ends up getting sold to customers as long as that uncertainty existed. Also, a couple of other notes on qualified supplies. It does not include general and administrative expenditures. And it can, it can include extraordinary utilities if you're working on some kind of experiment and you're tracking those costs separately. All right, the third category of expenses that we're going to talk about is contract research. So this could be your consultants. If you have a winemaker that you're hiring as a consultant. If you are paying an outside lab or a, a testing facility to run tests for you, as long as their research is being performed within the United States, then we can pick up a portion of those costs. And that actually applies to all research. 
all of the research has to be performed within the United States to qualify. So a couple of other things to note on contract research. You have to show that you have some element of financial risk. So if you're paying your contractors based on time and material, that's fine. Now, there's no guarantee that the product is going to work the way you want it to. It's going to taste, feel the way you want it to. No, no guarantee it's going to sell. Then those are all positive facts. Also, third-party testing facilities, you know, they can test it all they want, but at the end of the day, that doesn't mean it's going to work the way you want it to. So those are positive facts. And also, you have to show that you have substantial rights in the research. Generally, I don't see this as a problem, but let's say you had an agreement with some third party, like a third party winemaker, and he says, you know, he or she say they own the entire formulation and you have to pay them royalties on that, on any future sales. That could present some issues. And so when we're performing these types of studies, we would generally request any contractual agreements between you and your consultants just to make sure that you're complying with all of these requirements. Also, one other thing to mention here is that we have to take a, a small haircut on contract expenses. We can only pick up 65% of those costs. All right, thanks, Travis. We're going to talk a little bit now about the mechanics that go into calculating the credit. Um, and there, there are two different ways that we can do this, the first of which is the traditional method. So this is established, the credit was established um, as an incentive for increasing the research activities. Um, increasing is going to be the key word here. So this particular method really rewards companies that have a consistently increased spending, spending pattern. Uh, the way that the credit is calculated under the traditional method uh, is it's 20% of the excess of QREs or qualified research expenses for the current tax year over a base amount. And that base period amount is the product of a taxpayer's fixed base percentage, which itself is calculated from prior year gross receipts and qualified expenses. And then the average annual gross receipts for the four tax years preceding the current year. Uh, it's important to note here that we, uh, if, if the company is a little bit older, say they started in the 80s, we may have to go back to the 80s and look at, look at expenditures and, and gross receipts in those prior year returns. Um, I also want to mention that the base amount cannot be less than 50% of the qualified research expense for the credit year. So uh, in, in that respect, we're somewhat limited in how low the base amount can go. Obviously, the lower base amount, uh, the higher credit that we're going to get as a result. So here's a pretty simplified example of what that traditional credit is going to look like. So this particular company would have a million dollars in qualified research for the given year uh, with an average of $10 million in revenue over the prior four years. Uh, the fixed base percentage in this case is set at 3%. Um, it's worth mentioning that 3% is the statutory rate for the first five years of the company is in business. And then after that, we have to calculate it. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, that, that may involve going way back in history and looking at some old tax returns. So the, the product of, the, of A and B here is going to be $300,000, and then half of the expenses, remember the limiting factor, is $500,000. So since um, the calculated base amount is less than half of the expenses, we have to sit with this $500,000 base. So the gross R&D credit, which is calculated at 20%, is going to be $100,000, so 20% of that $500,000. Um, and then this next line here is, is taxes from the ad back. So when we calculate a credit, in this case, we would have to add $100,000 uh, back into income, and we do that by just reducing the deduction for, for 174 research expenses. Um, the add back results in $35,000 in extra, in extra tax. Uh, so, so really the net R&D benefit here is going to be $65,000. All right, the second method that we look at for calculating the credit is the alternative simplified credit method. Uh, so this takes revenues out of the equation, uh, and we don't have to go back to the beginning of time to establish a base. So the base here is going to be um, based on, on the prior three years of qualified research expenses. Um, so the other thing that's worth mentioning is we don't necessarily need to show an increase in spending year over year. As long as there's not a significant decrease in spending, uh, the, cr the credit can remain relatively consistent with a flat level of spending. Um, so, so the mechanics of this one, we're looking at 14% of the current year qualified research exp expenses that exceed a three-year base. 
Um, that base is calculated uh, by averaging the total prior year three or, or prior three years of QREs, taking 50% of that. Um, or if there are no qualified expenses in the previous years, it's 6% over that base. So again, we're eliminating revenues from the base calculation here. Um, it's also important to mention that the ASC can be elected on effect or on amended returns as of 2014. Um, uh, the caveat being only if the traditional method was not elected on the return being amended. So if we're going back to say 2014, amending a return um, that credits were claimed on using the traditional method, we'd have to stick with the traditional method. For amending a return where there are no credits claimed, uh, we can use the ASC. All right, so again, with a pretty simplified example, uh, qualified research expenses are, are going to be the same as we were looking at with the traditional method of a million dollars. And here, instead, we're calculating the base period uh, with three prior years QREs. 1.6 million, half of that average is going to be 266,000 and change. So the QREs over that base amount is 733,000 and some change. So the gross R&D credit before that add back is going to be 14% of that base, so $102,667. Um, similarly, we have to, we'd have to add that gross credit back uh, resulting in some extra income tax of 35933 So our net result here is going to be a little bit higher than it was in, in an example with similar facts of $66,733. All right, so I mean, you can have all the credits in the world, but they're worthless if you can't use them. And so the way we approach this, one of the first things that we look at is we look at your tax situation and see, you know, are these credits actually usable? And here's some of the different ways that they can be limited. So obviously if you're a company in losses, you're not paying any federal income tax, you can't claim a credit against federal income tax unless you're eligible for that $250,000 payroll credit that I mentioned earlier. A second way that this can be limited is through AMT. So I'm not going to really get into the mechanics of AMT, but if, if that's familiar to you, if you've heard of that before, it's something worth taking a look at because it can limit the amount of credits that you're able to take. Uh, another way it can be limited, these 382 and 383 limitations, those are code sections. I'm not going to get into that too much except for if your company has been through a lot of ownership changes, then this limitation could apply. And then the fourth one here, what this basically means, the 41G, it means that if you own more than one company and you've got an R&D company over here that's not making any money, it's only for R&D, you're getting a bunch of credits from that company, you can't take those credits and apply them over here to your other profitable business that's generating a bunch of income. So in other words, you have to take the credits against the company that actually generated them in the first place. All right, on to our third polling question. Which of the following are qualified expenses? Your options are wages, supplies, contract research, or all of the above. And for those of you that would like a copy of today's slide deck, you can download them from the folder that says slide deck and handouts to the right of the slide view. We will also be sending the slides via email after the webcast. And a couple more seconds here. And let's take a look at the results. All right, there was actually no wrong answer here because all of them are qualified research expenses. I'd say the best answer was probably the last one, all of the above. All right, so I'm going to touch a little bit on recent audit trends. So if you ever find yourself in a situation where your R&D credits are audited, I want to talk a little bit about what you can expect. So a little bit of background about the process here. So back in 2007, 2008 timeframe, the R&D credit was what they called a tier one issue at the IRS. So that meant that any company that amended their tax return to claim an R&D credit was automatically audited. And the audit process was intense. They would issue a mandatory list of questions that you had to answer it didn't really matter how big your company was, it was an intense process. So I just want to mention that that tiered process is gone, no longer exists, so there's no more automatic audits. 
The IRS has restructured some things to make the audit process a little more efficient. The way they do it now is they set up these issue practice groups. And you can think of that as maybe like a task force. And what happens is if the credit gets audited, you have a field agent there that may not know very much about R&D credits. And so they will consult with some people from this issue practice group who have more experience or some technical expertise in the area of R&D credits. A lot of times what they'll do is they'll assign an engineer who is supposed to know the industry to help with the examination. Also, you know, around the same time, I mentioned 2007, 2008, the state of California had its own fiscal issues, and they saw what the IRS was doing, and they also jumped in and started auditing credits left and right. And so, you know, at the time, back then, 2007, 8, 9, even 10 time frame, we were seeing a lot of audits of R&D credits, both at the federal and the state level. Since then, there's been a whole lot of court cases that have come out and it helped provide some guidance on some of those areas that needed additional clarification. So we're seeing things kind of even out a little bit. Um, now the IRS, the way they audit things is they have these compliance campaigns where they'll, they'll target a specific issue and then go after it. And as of today, RMV is not one of those compliance campaigns. And so, I mean, that could change any day. So it's something that we keep an eye on. However, we do know it's still on their priority list. In 2017, the R&D credits again made their list of dirty dozen tax schemes. So the overall message there from the IRS is that if you're claiming R&D credits, you better have the right documentation in place or they will deny them and assess penalties. And so, I'm not going to dig into this other stuff too much, the new IDR enforcement and uh, appeals process. I will note that you know, sometimes we go through these examinations and the credits get denied at the field level, and then we take them up and we take them up through the appeals process at the IRS where we generally see more positive results from a reasonable appeals officer. Again, no guarantee of that, but just want to give you some insight to what we're seeing. All right, and some of the areas that are most likely to be focused on upon an examination are these items here. And the first one is funded research. So if you are a, let's say, a winemaker consultant and your clients are paying you for time and materials or they're just paying you by the hour, you don't really have any risk and therefore you're not able to claim a credit if you are the winemaking consultant. Now, if you're the company paying the winemaking consultant, that's a whole different story. So funded research, you know, that's the only time I ever see it really apply with wineries and brewers. So something to, to watch out for. And also contemporaneous documentation. You know, we're going to go through some examples of what will be valid upon examination. A lot of this stuff are things that you probably already have or that we can build upon as we get into some of the next slides. Another area that's important is what we call nexus. That means that you have to show some kind of connection between your qualified research expenses and your activities. So even if you don't have project tracking in place, and most of our clients do not have project tracking, we have to show some kind of connection between the two, even if it's something that we build or manufacture using reasonable estimates. Something that they all want to see, IRS and the FTB. Also, the base computation, Andrew kind of mentioned it earlier, it's an easy area to pick on, especially if you're going way back in time. It's, it's just an easy area for them to poke at. They'll say, you know, show me documentation from the base years. And also, you know, they want to see that you're using consistent methodology and consistent expenses from year to year. Uh, lastly, another, another easy area for them to pick on is high wage executives. So if you're making Unreasonable compensation, it's something that you'll want to look out for. So let's talk about the types of documentation that you can use to support your credit claims and would hopefully help upon examination. So documentation should be all these other things that I mentioned earlier, and then some. So it should provide a nexus between qualified activities and expenses, 
It should, you know, most importantly, your documentation should show that you're meeting the four-part test. So we want documentation that's going to show there were uncertainties and then there was some level of experimentation. And, you know, most of the time the, the issues we see are there aren't good record time tracking records. I mean, that's probably the most common. It's probably the most common issue that we see. Um, like I said, it's something that we can estimate. But, um, oh, also, the documentation should be as contemporaneous as possible. So that means if you are, you know, capturing credits from four or five years ago and you're just now producing records or documentations for it or just now creating them, that's probably not going to look good in the eyes of the IRS. So examples of documentation. These are some very general examples. So I'm going to start with these general examples and then we'll get into more specifics based on your industry. So the first set of items that I have listed here are probably items you don't think of when you think about documenting R&D credits. You know, you should have your payroll records. So the W-2s that you have for employees. The general ledger expense detail. So that means the cost that you're paying to vendors. It should show the amount that you paid them, the date that you paid them, their name, and any other description in your general ledger that would be helpful. Also, any old tax returns, we're, we're going to need them. You have, to, you have to be able to produce your old tax returns. If you can't find them and uh, you get examined, the IRS isn't going to produce them for you. I can tell you based on firsthand experience. Also, if you have any vendors or customers with contracts, we need to take a look at those. We need to evaluate the terms of those agreements, and it needs to be added to the documentation file. Also, okay, if, if you don't remember any of this, but you remember one thing, remember this. We need to have a good list of projects. So if you're going through the year and you're thinking about R&D credits, just start making a list. Make a list of the projects because we can use that as a baseline and really build on top of it. Some of the other things that are helpful are project notes, design documents, email communications, pictures, things of that nature would be helpful. One other thing that I want to point out is that if you have failures along the way, if you did things that didn't work the way you wanted to, make sure you're documenting that or saving that documentation. If it didn't work very well, send somebody an email and tell them about it. Tell them about the things that didn't work. Uh, those are very helpful forms of documentation. All right, so in the interest of time, I'm just going to run through these slides. They will be available for download, as mentioned, and you can take a look at the list. We've made a list for each industry. These are the types of documentation that we generally see that are helpful for supporting R&D credits. We've got some for wineries, a list here for breweries, we're hoping that some of these items look familiar. And also, you know, we can help provide documentation. So as I mentioned before, your documentation, you know, some of the records you already have internally are a good starting point. They're a good baseline that we can help build upon. Generally, we come in and we interview the brewers, the winemakers, the technical folks, your technicians, and we help to build that documentation. And what you want to show is that your activities meet all four of those requirements. So it's something we have a lot of experience with. We're primarily here on the West Coast, but we serve all 50 states. We have 20 to 25 people who just do R&D tax credits. So we're more than willing to help out. We have a ton of experience defending credit claims upon IRS and FTP, FTB examination. And we can also, you know, help you figure out what types of documentation that you should start keeping on a go-forward basis and make recommendations for improving your processes going forward. All right. Our final polling question. True or false? Estimates can be used to support R&D credit claims as long as those estimates can be backed by contemporaneous documentation and credible corroborating testimony. So please select true or false. And once you have completed all CPE requirements, you'll be able to download a PDF of your CPE certificate from the certification widget to the right of the slide view. And just a few more seconds. Let's take a look at the results. 
It's like most people got it right. It's true. The answer is true. You want estimates that can be supported by uh, documentation and corroborating, te corroborating testimony. Okay, so some of the new law, I'm going to blaze through this really quickly. A few things to highlight. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that payroll credit. So the 200, up to $250,000 a year can be used to offset payroll taxes if you're a company that's not profitable. And the way you qualify for this is you have to have less than $5 million in revenue, and you have to have revenues for less than five years. So you have to be a new company. This is mostly for startup companies. And then the AMT offsets for eligible small businesses. That means if you have less than $50 million in revenue on average over the prior three years, then don't worry about AMT because the AMT is not going to apply to your company. Um, that AMT offset kicks in for credits starting in 2016 and beyond. And payroll credits you have to claim on an original tax return. So these slides here get into the specifics of some of the things I just mentioned on AMT, the AMT provisions and the payroll tax offsets, and also put together kind of a quick summary of new tax reform topics and how they impacted R&D. Uh, the corporate AMT was repealed. I'm not sure if that's going to impact a lot of companies on the phone today, but something to be aware of. Also, the AMT exemptions and phase-outs increased for the next nine years. And so if you have over $50 million in revenue, this is going to help you. Then the credit rate or the corporate tax rate went down to 21%, which I'm sure everyone's aware of. And this has an impact on R&D credits because there's that add back to income and the amount of the gross credit that Andrew mentioned earlier. And that add back is going to be taxed at a lower rate. And so your credits will increase as a result. Also, you can currently deduct your R&D expenses, and but five or six years from now, you're going to have to capitalize all of them if that law actually takes effect. And then the last point here is just that the provisions with respect to AMT and payroll credits are in the final tax bill and will apply on a go-forward basis. So just a quick little recap, some of the key takeaways is that if your company is developing new products, processes, methods, or techniques, you can qualify. Also, there are general federal and state benefits. We can take a look at all open tax years and potentially get some refunds. And then finally, documentation is critical. We should not claim credits without proper documentation in place. All right, do we have time to answer any questions? Uh, looks like we have a couple minutes left for questions. If you have a question for either of our presenters, you can submit your question in the Q&A box, or you can reach out directly. Uh, our first question is, I've had the same CPA for a long time. Can you work with them to file credits on my return? Absolutely. So we do it all the time. So we work with a lot of smaller CPAs that don't have the technical expertise required to calculate and document R&D credits popular, uh, properly. And we work with them all the time to, to get all that stuff together, and we can provide them with the numbers that, that then gets claimed on your tax return. Awesome. Thank you. And we probably have time for one more. Does AMT offset flow to the personal return AMT for pass-throughs? Yes, it does. So a couple things to think about is if you have less than $50 million in revenue, the AMT is not going to apply. Should we find another place? And the, the new pass-through, um, the new provisions on AMT do apply to you at the pass-through or the shareholder level. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you for a great presentation. Uh, that's about all we have time for today. Again. You can still submit a question, and Travis or Andrew will be happy to follow up with you after the presentation. Um, as a reminder, if you attended today in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet found in the slide deck and handouts icon to the right of the slide view. If you participated as an individual and met all certification requirements, 
Your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window, also to the right of the slide view. And I'll keep the webcast console open for a few minutes to give you time to download your CPE certificate. A copy will be emailed within two weeks should you have any difficulty downloading it now. And here is a link to an online survey where you can provide feedback for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete this survey as your feedback is very important to us. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope you'll join us again next time. Thank you.